All right, and you? I'm I'm not dead yet, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always a condition we can't presume too much on anymore. You know, um, I think the truth of it is, is death is a lot closer than we realize sometimes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of it depends on the political scene. I don't think we are in a very stable period with what's going on uh, about this group of leftist propaganda. In, well, uh, the leftists have gotten so outrageous in the things that they say, uh, sometimes it leaves me speechless. I don't even have to respond to such absurd things. We have an educational system and a mass media that has nurtured that sort of thing. And we have a lot of people that are so agenda-driven that they can't appreciate any kind of complexity. And, you know, they only look for accomplishing their goals, no matter what the cost. What would be the perspective of the off-world intelligences about what's going on in this country right now? I've been assured that these complexities that we're seeing here today are not overrated and that uh, to be expected uh, that meaningful change uh, is <laughs> going to have opposition no matter what, no matter uh, what its message is, no matter what its benefits are, because this country has had opposition to meaningful social change now for the last 50 years. I don't foresee a need for the kind of disclosure that uh, Steve Bassett uh, talks about. I, I think that, and this I was a bit of a change of subject in, the se in a sense, but I think if there's any disclosure, it's going to come from, from the grassroots. What are your thoughts? I think the only way to actually get anything done is to stop the secrecy and uh, maintain secrecy only in terms of military activity that is going on that might be jeopardized and cost American soldiers their lives. Otherwise, I think that any time that there is a lack of disclosure, that there are secrets that are held from the public, I, I think too often the biggest harm that's done is that it's an, a convenient cover-up for wrongdoing. I mean, uh, we've had with so many cases in and out of, of the judicial system, out of the law enforcement system, where information that would lead to conviction or lead to being able to apply justice to the right parties has been suppressed by this in the interests of national security. I mean, uh, the American people are the ones suffering, not an enemy or not any perceived uh, notion of an enemy. And the CIA is the biggest drug dealer in this country. <laughs> and they're hidden because they can play this in the interests of national security, uh, and they do to the hilt. Well, who's in control of the CIA now? That's what I want to know. It has uh, a dark shadow group, and uh, it has all along. That's what the Dulles brothers created, because it was never intended to benefit the American people, just the oil companies originally. You know, one of the most important bits of information I think that you bring to the table, James, is your knowledge of the gigantic electromagnetic vehicles that have been spotted near Saturn and uh, near the Sun. And I know there's several things you want to cover tonight, but if you could at least start us out there, and then we'll see where we go next. Well, I owe a lot uh, to Dr. Norman Bergman, who discovered them in the rings of Saturn, not only in the rings of Saturn, but active in completing the A-ring. 
in the period of time of his research and the time that he published his book, uh, the A-ring had been completed when it hadn't been at the start. He was able to triangulate their size because of the probes that had entered the Cassini area, but that's the area between the rings. And uh, he determined that they were the size of North America. Now, that in itself was amazing, and it overcame the BS that uh, astronomers that, who are under their thumb of the Office of International Telegrams, which is nothing more than a front to suppress news that is inconvenient to these social engineers that don't want people to know the truth about the moon, about Mars, about what's going on in the distant reaches of our solar system, which is very organic, very active, and populated with people in most cases, just not people from here. Now, what's really sad about all of this is the evidence is being reported daily that uh, UFOs are real, that they can do things that n and not even experimental craft operating out of Area 51 can do. And you see examples of this that go back thousands of years when there was no Area 51, when there was no covert black ops in their uh, <laughs> deep secret uh, doings like the skunk works and you know people don't have a framework or don't utilize a framework that just a little bit of of history would give them if they did they wouldn't fall for this bs it's just like the the phoenix lights if you look at the consensus today about the phoenix lights you have this armchair consensus that the Phoenix Lights were a experimental craft coming from Skunk Works or Area 51. And, of course, that isn't true. The one investigator that spent the most time interviewing witnesses found a number of witnesses seeing them do spectacular things that nothing on Earth, no technology on Earth, could even conceive of. And, you know, uh, the display they made was an indication that we're here and we're watching and we're willing to help. You know, there have been uh, incidents and I'm sure that people in the highest levels of government and in uh, government agencies know what I'm saying and know that uh, the offer is still open to help us. But that is required that we, as I say, get over the hump. We've got to, to do a number of things to get that help, but they're all for our benefit. We should do them anyway. I mean, if Fukushima hasn't taught us about nuclear energy, that these reactors aren't safe, and they aren't safe because we can't do anything without corruption. We had a reactor here, 50 miles from where I'm sitting right now, uh, that at the time that it was being built, there were issues about the wells on stainless steel being inadequate. Now, this may not sound like much, but I'm talking about the containment area for the cores and for the depleted fuel that's in these containment cooling systems. Uh, <laughs> And the person who was leading the movement as a whistleblower gave up and got the job of a safety inspector instead of furthering the movement to get anything done about these bad wells. So today, if you're wondering uh, what happened to correct that problem, wonder no more. It wasn't corrected. So, you know, if that's a, a scenario of how things are done in building these reactors then, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's no doubt they're not safe. They're not safe because of the corruption that keeps people from living up to the regulations that would perhaps make them safer. I don't think the technology exists to have stable reactors uh, when so much is at risk. I mean, it doesn't take very many of them to pollute this planet beyond recovery. Are the uh, 
the EMVs, are they modifying our solar system right now? Yes. Yeah, this is an ongoing thing. Uh, you have a new planet uh, where Planet X used to be. And uh, I say Planet X because uh, this was uh, a planet that was disintegrated some time ago and created the asteroid belt. You no longer have a, an appreciable asteroid belt because that material has been collected and the planet has been built out of it for various reasons. Were you here in a previous life when the original planet was destroyed that created our asteroid belt? Yes. Do you have any memories that you can pass on to us? I do, but uh, there again, it involves uh, uh, very much the same thing that, uh, that happens whenever you have a culture that reaches a certain level and does not outgrow its technology. By that, I mean it keeps delving into projects like HARP and like uh, uh, the Hadron Collider. Uh, that, that's, you know, I want to see how bad bad really is kind of crap. It's like uh, if the military had the ultimate weapon, and this ultimate weapon would lead to destruction of the entire planet. If even tested, the bastards would do it. Hmm. So, what kind of help do we need from these off-world intelligences? They have technology that's inconceivable. They can uh, rebuild a coral in the Gulf of Mexico. It would take a few years, but right now it would take 10,000 years by, with what you possess as technology. They can seed the atmosphere and restore the tiny organisms that help filter your sunlight. That's why you have white sunlight now. When, when we were boys, yeah. we had yellow sunlight. Yeah, yeah, that's very true, James. People don't realize that. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the chemtrails... The fact that they have put industrial waste in jet fuel because uh, kerosene, which is what JP5 and JP4 consist of primarily, burns pretty clean. People used it as light for their homes 150 years and had no problems. It does leave a little soot on the roof, on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it's not harmful to breathe. You know, but... <laughs> No, uh, industrial waste uh, is even added to pharmaceuticals, and most pharmaceuticals consist of some extraction from industrial waste. It's because these companies that produce industrial waste are very anxious to find cheap ways of getting rid of it, like BP was interested in getting rid of its vast stores of Corexit. Are the EMVs sentient? No, no. Uh, uh, they have an emotional language. They uh, are task-driven. They are very well regarded by ETs. They are the creators and tools for engineering planets and moons and, and uh, even regulating the intensity of stars that... Uh, our sun is a star, and it has the ability to maintain life in this solar system with its energy. But at the same time, it can decimate a planet in a heartbeat. And uh, the coronal mass ejections that bypass us, that other planets in this solar system are protected by, and you can find evidence of that in NASA videos and images. I mean, there was a CME heading for the closest planet to the sun. It would directly hit it, and an EMV wrapped itself around the planet to protect it. And there's a video of that. And the same is true of another planet. But these things are there for you to see. I mean, NASA tries to hide them by changing the catalog number when you go into their archives, the same as they try to do with that video that was taken by the shuttle 
STS-48, it's listed as uh, sometimes STS-68 or whatever, but it, it's a shuttle showing uh, an operation where UFOs were used to test a particle beam cannon. So, <laughs> uh, and they were uh, definitely not Earth origin, making right-hand turns and accelerating from uh, 30 some odd thousand miles an hour to 120,000 miles an hour as it make a right turn and goes over the horizon to miss the firing of that particle beam cannon. And that's been shown on 2020 as it's a documentary. And uh, of course, uh, the occasion of that and the circumstance of that's very interesting. Why are we firing particle beams at these ships? Well, we, we're proving out that the particle beam cannon can come close to hitting the ship. But, of course, these were EB craft. EBs were cooperating with the experiment, with the operation. So they were forewarned. Now, had they not been forewarned, the particle beam cannon might have taken that lead UFO out. But uh, I'm talking about something that there is a video of that's been shown to the public on 2020. I mean, I only talk about what I can point to. Right. Are these electromagnetic vehicles, are they organic or are they machine? Yes. Oh, they yes. are organic. They're living. They're living. Yes. And uh, you can ask me a number of questions that I can tell you about, but as far as their origin, I think their origin comes from the designer of the universe and you know, of the solar systems and galaxies in it. Uh, I believe that there, I believe in God, and I believe this comes directly from that, that uh, origin. I always have. I can't explain it because, like I say over and over again, I'm no closer to the face of God than are you. Do you think the universe has an intelligence? Oh, yes. I think it has a form of what you might call the beat of a heart. A tendency to want to grow and add more to uh, its collection of life. And it revels in creating something new to see how it's going to turn out, to hope that there is a, a growth, that, that progress uh, necessarily can be, under the right conditions, can become growth. And right now, uh, there's great perplexity uh, about Earth. You have a unique people that have split consciousness no one else in the universe has, or no one else at least in the galaxy and in uh, close galaxies does. And, uh, you know, at, at first this was thought to be a frailty uh, because of the ambivalence, because of the aberrance that uh, you possess with it, but looking closer at it and my ability to have the human experience and then to convey that to leaders within the extended community that is in your neighborhood, we have begun to appreciate more and more that it might be a contribution to this effort that's behind the origin of the universe, which uh, has an intelligence, our heartbeat to build something continually, to grow. The universe is constantly growing. And that's exemplified by the fact that every body in it, every astral body in it, is moving at the same rate. What's it moving from? Is it moving from a center? You know, astronomers are more blinded by what they build as theories and than they are by what they actually see. And what they think they see is not necessarily what's there. Because there's an impairment to their perception when they labor under these uh, rudimentary theories that really have no place in trying to be objective and trying to understand a phenomena when you can't agree that there is a basic design to it, that you can't answer fundamental questions like, why is a planet and a moon round, perfectly round? And time and, and happenstance can't do that any more than evolution itself can create sentience. Sentience comes from one place in the whole universe. 
You are wedded genetically to one place. And when you, when you know that, and when you know there are people out there more vast than you, then your whole worldview will change for the better. Because the ethnocentrism that's here is uh, your biggest undoing. Does the universal consciousness, does it learn and, and evolve? Well, it, it is reflected in the consciousness of unified consciousness. You have access to the collective consciousness and to genetic memory. And you can access it at your will. But with the split consciousness, part of your mind is constantly confronting and warring with the other part of your mind. Your conscious mind is so afraid of your subconscious <laughs> that it's at war with it. And the only time that you actually access it is in dreams. Mm. And, you know, that's what in the ancient times, uh, the interpretation of dreams uh, was held in high esteem. And if you were a good interpreter of dreams, you were in the court of the king or the pharaoh, and you were held in high esteem. And that's across the board. That even existed up until Constantine in Rome. And there are people, even today, that utilize uh, psychics for that very thing, but, you know, they're not taught how to really interpret dreams because the people that could have taught them the adepts have left this planet hmm. they gave up on you long ago that's why today you don't have genius across the board like you did with Michelangelo Leonardo da Vinci these men had genius across the board anything they touched Today, you have a genius in physics or chemistry or mathematics, but not in anything else. No, it's specialized. It's not true genius because it doesn't interrelate. And I'll tell you why. When chemistry and physics were separated, then a great injustice was done to the advance of science. And today, you know, you have a lot of doctors, uh, medical doctors, that don't know what microbiologists are discovering every day because they're not interested. They would rather get their knowledge from the pharmaceutical salesman comes around to their office and gives freebie samples away. And we've all seen that. If you've ever sat in a doctor's office waiting for your appointment, so we have a conscious mind, a subconscious, and an unconscious mind. Is the real power in the subconscious or unconscious minds? It's like this. I mean, and I would like to relate it as a parallel with Electrum. When you know the exact proportions and, and the procedure for... Uh, Mixing gold with silver, you can produce a metal electrum that has properties neither have. The same is true if you unify the subconscious and the conscious mind, you have properties, you have accesses that you don't have with either. Is it painful for you to be under split consciousness now, or are you not under split consciousness? No, I don't have split consciousness, and I, I'm not able to be hypnotized. I don't sleep like you do. I go into a state, and uh, I thought for, for a long time, as I was growing up and maturing, I thought that I did dream like everybody else, but... The, the thing was that uh, the dreams, uh, what I thought were dreams, were not. But they were experiences that I was having in a state of travel. Does humanity on Earth have a collective subconscious? Well, no. The subconscious is uh, an instinctive thing. The conscious mind 
is more of a, a collective thing if it could have the virtues of unified consciousness where it has super concentration and access to the collective consciousness, genetic memory, all of the things that, that give you what your ancestors had. Do you believe that love is a, a creational natural law of the universe? Yes, yes. It, it comes from uh, being able to accept another for what they are and still caring about them. To make it a priority, even though that person is not perfect, even though that person may have done a little bit of injury to you or whatever through understanding. And, of course, it's easily had if you have super concentration because you see beyond your own self-interest. You see that the future can be dictated in a way with more options. But if you are possessed of hate, if you're possessed of obsession, the limiting factor of these things is so incredible that you don't have the same amount of viable options for your future that you would have if you were free of those things. At what time does the spirit enter the uh, fetus in terms of the number of days? Is it 21 days? Is it three months? Or well, you, you know that there have been uh, religious, uh, occult, a uh, number of things uh, with this. Uh, it's not a set thing. The idea that life doesn't become uh, worthy uh, sometime in the womb, I think it actually, its worth, its value, its uh, priority should be placed on at the time of inception. Now, what becomes of that later on, and at what time uh, that it uh, receives spirit or soul, I think is a matter of, of it'll always be of conjecture. But it's not really important to know. I mean, the potential for that inception to possess a soul is what's important. And it will, uh, if given enough time. Now, that may differ. I mean, there are walk-ins. There are instances like me. There are all sorts of things that can happen, though rarely. Uh, so that confuses the issue. So if I told you... 21 days or after inception or if I told you in the second trimester or whatever, it wouldn't be completely true. So, I mean, life is always, there's no point at which life doesn't have purpose. Now, what that purpose may be and what may it might become, that's a question mark. I mean, free will is an expression of allowing option and placing a priority on it. Now, the same is true for nature. The same is true for inception. The same is true for the soul. It's all a matter of circumstance, of how things grow, and what the purpose is. And so you can't corral all those things together and put a date on them. Do you think it's important for a human being to learn how to control his thoughts? I think more than anything else, it's important for them to control, learn how to control their actions. And I think the, that there are, are always going to be dark thoughts, that that is a way of working out that uh, for a person to realize their dark thoughts. And uh, it's like the old saying, no virtue untested is not virtue. But we all have our demons. We all, I, I, I had mine. Uh, I'm, I've been through uh, six extinctions here on this planet, and I wish I'd been more patient with each one. This one, uh, since this is, will be the last, uh, I'm hoping that uh, there's a different outcome, and I'm far more patient and uh, have given a great deal more consideration than I did in the former extinctions. So, you were here when 
the EMVs took away their protection from the Earth, and they left they left the Earth vulnerable to these uh, coronal mass ejections. Is that what you're talking about? Twice. Four of them, you did it to yourself. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So we destroyed ourselves four times. Yes. Was it nuclear usually? Uh, three of those four times, yes. Another time you were trying to, uh, you were undertaking something like HARP, and uh, you were using it in conjunction with uh, other renegade technology, and you split the earth. It had to be repaired, and that's why there's an operation in Utah holding it together. An operation that uh, the government is aware has, possesses a, a huge anomaly that they have ha been monitoring now for 25, well, 30, 30 years, over 30 years, 31 years to be exact. They have built an underground base uh, underneath the LaSalle mountain range, which is circular. That's a, a hint. And uh, they're monitoring that, that one area that I've talked about where uh, I visited and several times and where I was, was given a full memory of my past. Uh, what year was that? Do you recall the year? Yes, I do. And at that point, you knew your connection with the EMVs? I always did. I mean, uh, emotionally. I knew that uh, there was something that made it very difficult for me to, to uh, tolerate uh, relationships that other people take for granted, you know, I, all my ex-wives thought I was too aloof, and uh, possibly I was, but I would go off, uh, my second wife uh, hated the fact that I would spend entire summers out prospecting in Utah, and uh, that, you know, all my life I've taken licenses, my first wife was upset because of my excursions uh, in an area of Ohio that was another area of high anomaly. And, you know, since then, I've, been, I've never been able to share, like I'm sharing with you now, with my ex-wives. Uh, I, I never felt like they were capable, uh, that they would have just uh, think I was off my rocker if I had told them anything whatsoever. I tried to take one of them to... Uh, an area where she could see a UFO and even interact with it. And uh, she was too afraid. And uh, that was my first wife. Another wife saw enough that she should know I wasn't a ne necromancer, but that was uh, her take on it later on after we were divorced. And I was exposing her illegal activities that led to stealing $2.8 billion from the Treasury of Texas. And uh, that's in the book I wrote, Siege in the Davis Mountains, if anyone is interested. And, uh, you know, a number of other uh, finesses, uh, which I couldn't share. I mean, uh, I discovered that uh, my last wife was uh, working for the wrong side, even while we were married. And uh, she is behind the loss of a close friend. You know, so. some people are not ready for this kind of information, and I think that there's a, a burden that comes with knowing this kind of information and, and not being able to share it with people that you would like to be able to share it with. Yes. Uh, in fact, I never said anything, never uh, exposed much information about myself at all, much less about the MVs. Until Dr. Bergen wrote his book, and I got in touch with him, and uh, we be, we became uh, friendly, and we we were communicating up until I told him that the EMVs would be seen in the sun, and he said, "How do you know that?" 
And he kept repeating, uh, how do you know that? How do you know that? And finally, I told him. I said, I'm not from here. And, of course, being a scientist and being near retirement, he wasn't able to cope with that. So I, later on, I had to work with an associate of his, Casey Dawkins, very fine lady, who it was very close to him. And uh, then uh, a person that I was working with to try to see if I could bring them closer to unified consciousness, which was a project of mine, uh, he turned on the object of my work and on Dr. Bergeron too. I had introduced him to Dr. Bergeron and so Dr. Bergeron trusted him with some information which he used to try and debunk Dr. Bergeron and uh, I discovered that and I revealed that to Dr. Bergeron and uh, of course that didn't make me look good since I had introduced him to Dr. Bergeron but Casey Dawkins understood that was unfortunate, but Dr. Bergren, his work made me more anxious to correct the misinterpretations that were being placed on the MVs as threatening when they are, you know, they are, they protect the planets in the solar system by farming, and I mean F-A-R-M-I-N-G, farming, the energy of the sun. And uh, every time the sunspot starts, uh, when it uh, leads to flares, they will whip those flares out so it doesn't concentrate in, into CMEs. That was first noticed by a group of amateur astronomers that I, back during Hellbop, when it came through, I told them to watch it as it came between Earth and the sun. And they could see that it had two nuclei. And... Uh, I told them to watch it as it passed the sun, and they did. And uh, Hellbop lost the two nuclei, and uh, then they could see the MVs in the sun, and they saw them interacting with the solar flares, which was something spectacular. And, of course, I am sure that NASA and uh, astronomers working in observatories around the world have seen the same thing and uh, have been under duress not to discuss it, not to report their finds, and that under the strict suppression that Kevin Smith discovered when an astronomer at a meeting started discussing two planets in the solar system that were not to be discussed, was bundled off the stage and I lost track, and he lost track of whether this astronomer ever appeared before. But if you are an astronomer, just about anywhere in the world, and you make a discovery, you are supposed to, by your professional relationship with your superiors, to report it to the Office of Astronomical Telegrams. And they review it and determine whether you can go public with it. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, I discuss all of this, I've discussed it, and uh, uh, Kevin Smith uh, found the agency that was responsible for the suppression of this information, and, uh, you know, it hasn't changed in 50 years. There was a time when, for hundreds of years, transient lunar phenomena was uh, cataloged and reported openly. And you could find it, and I'm talking about uh, lights on the moon, uh, tracks and down in the craters of uh, some vehicle, uh, crystalline structures, uh, a number of other things that would be there one day and be gone the next. That hence transient lunar phenomena. Activity, in other words. In 1938, these became classified. Now, there's still reports there if you go back before 1938, and you can read about transient lunar phenomena, but since then, you can't. And then, and at the same time, the Green Canali that had been reported by an Italian who named them the, the Canali disappeared from Mars. That's weird. And at the same time, the polar caps became very slight. They were far more prominent. They were feeding the Canali. So, 
All of this is something people need to know. In 1968, Walter Sullivan, who was editor, science editor for the New York Times, wrote a book called We Are Not Alone. And in it, he divulged that scientists all over the world uh, in astrophysics and astronomy all knew that Phobos was made of metal, mm-hmm. was hollow inside, and arti- hence artificial. And, uh, you know, in 1968. And uh, if you can get uh, hold of the book, I'm sure that that's one on the CIA collection list. Uh, if you can get a hold of the book, uh, it's interesting to read because there are other revelations in it, too. But nonetheless, you know, how many people today are aware that Phobos is an artificial satellite? An artificial satellite that was built by your ancestors with the help of a peoples that helped them. Um, other people probably don't know that Hermann Oberth, the mentor of Werner von Braun, said at a public meeting in the 1970s that the Germans could not take credit for all of their technological advancements because they had been helped by people of other worlds. And there's a a well-known scientist saying that in public and having it recorded. You can listen to that out on YouTube. I, I always think that's pretty amazing. Well, uh, it wasn't people of other worlds. It was the blondes. Now, they are established uh, uh, elsewhere, but they are products uh, of this planet, too. And they broke with uh, the people in the third extinction, before the third extinction, and survived because they, uh, they became able to uh, have support and aid from the extended community, and they acquired the unified consciousness. They have a base in Antarctica in a valley that has semi-tropical environment. Dr. Bird uh, was taken there in a plane, a transport plane he was in with a crew that was more or less, you can say, abducted, and he met the elder. And he wrote about this in his first book on his second expedition to Antarctica, which on the story that I'm telling you only appeared in the first London edition of the book. Now, I had a copy of it, but uh, it was in my garage when my hot water heater blew. Hmm. I had put it out there to secrete it with a number of other books that I praised, and uh, it was too close to the floor, got wet, got mildew, and... Uh, you don't keep books that have mildew, to you because that kind of stuff will spread to your other books. So I, not realizing how rare that book would be, later on, I got rid of it, but I wish I'd kept it. But the story was in his diary, and uh, some of his family members can tell you that that diary was taken and uh, rewritten. Hmm. I would say uh, edited. Hmm. Like so many other things. And, of course, there are a number of people that have been exposed and have come out and uh, vetted this to a large extent. And uh, even the little uh, fake magazine had a story about it. Of course, I don't go by everything that I find in fake magazine, but uh, it was interesting. And, of course, uh, when I acquired that copy and read it, there is no coincidence that that particular valley in Antarctica uh, is a no-fly zone. And what followed later on when Little America was built, which was uh, a base that uh, the United States built in Antarctica, but they made the mistake. This was before reactors could have any stability at all, and they used an energy resource from a primitive nuclear reactor that wasn't stable, and they were warned by the blondes about that. So the State Department, in all its infinite wisdom and um, military, decided that they'd show the blondes a thing or two, right? (laughs) So they got Admiral Byrd, 
to head operation. What was it called? Uh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. And they put an armada together. And, of course, they had to have an icebreaker leading it. And so uh, they headed to show the blondes a thing or two, and they met one of the blondes' UFOs. And uh, they were communicated with to turn back. And they didn't heed it, so the blondes uh, vaporized the icebreaker, and everybody else knew they'd better clear out before the ice uh, froze them in. Hmm. So that ended the expedition. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Operation, Operation High, High Jump. Jump. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We bought, both remembered that at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Do the uh, blondes wear clothes when they are in their ships? No, they don't. I mean, in my experience, I mean, I've never seen uh, the young, younger blondes. Uh, now the elder does. The elder wears a, a robe very much like... Uh, Greek or Roman robe, and uh, he's uh, very wise, has a sense of humor that the uh, young men don't seem to have, and uh, they're very statuesque. Uh, they, the men average about seven foot two or more, and uh, women uh, six foot eight, and they're very, uh, some of them are taller than that. They're very statuesque, they're beautiful, and uh, they're... Uh, <laughs> uh, they're ethnic racist, though. <laughs> they do not. Uh, there is one that was a friend of, that was uh, more or less an experiment. That I think you know Jerry Wills, who was, yeah. Uh, was, uh, yeah, he was, he was a blonde, but he renegated. And that he did something that the blondes find unforgivable. He took a, an earth, a birthbound wife. Oh. And of course, that's not, kosher and he uh, does have character frailties and a split consciousness i'm sure from them so you know they kind of dropped him like a hot potato but i'm sure that uh, he insists he was a he was a blonde and and i believe him but uh, i asked him one time when his consciousness had been repaired unified consciousness and he said that it had, but I don't believe him, because uh, there are some of the things that uh, uh, character flaws that I, I see in him. Um, you said you weren't from here, and I don't think that statement is quite as simple as some people might think, because I think during this life you were probably born on the Earth, correct? Yes, yes. I'm... Uh, Physically, uh, an earthbound, just like you, only I have unified consciousness, access to genetic memory and collective consciousness, and I have uh, all the memories of my past. What is Solar Anvil? It's a device which enables a constant place for a portal that can be used from deep space to travel. And uh, for people that have reached a level of technology where they've acquired star travel technology, and in order to survive to star travel technology, you must have what I call gotten over the hump. And so you're permitted to use the solar anvil for travel. You come from deep space and you're carrying a load. You have a rather large craft. That's the best way to go because you can't exceed the speed of light. And also when you, we have NASA images of craft coming through the solar anvil, speeding out from it because they would lose a lot of energy trying to protect themselves from the heat of the corona of the sun. Mm -hmm. And they're large cylindrical craft, probably about the size of the panhandle of Texas. Probably, that's what I would guess. So, these sh ships can go into the solar anvil, and then they'll... Well, they go into a, a, another fixed place, uh, another star with a similar solar anvil. And they enter there, and they can be from there to here, which is on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. They can be here, which is a, a good starting off place to go to a new galaxy, 
they can be here in seconds. So, are you saying the the gravity well, so to speak, of these different stars are all connected? Not all. Not all. I mean, there's some systems that shouldn't have sentient life for a number of reasons, uh, either because they're not they're in a stage of growth that is still not stable, or they are too near activities that uh, will threaten them, or they have a history of disruption due to the cultures there not outgrowing their technology and trying to do things that end in disaster. James, as always, this has been a fantastic conversation. I can't believe a whole hour has gone by. What I think I'd like to do tonight is have you kind of make some closing statements and let's keep it to an hour and then maybe we can get you back pretty soon. Um, but I feel like we've only been talking five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a compliment. Thank you. So why don't you tell us, uh, I don't know, any closing statements if you wanted to just mention your book, your website or anything like that. or And we'll try to get back with you pretty quickly if that's okay with you because I mean I, I love these conversations and they could go on all night <laughs> my book was banned in the United States it's an e-book I wanted to get it out before the election everything in it is true and not only true but something that I live through I make statements that uh, are inflammatory they're inflammatory because they are penetrating and because I name names, I don't hold back anything. I don't hold back anything, and uh, uh, I don't compromise with the truth. So there are three major revelations in there, and uh, I'm not going to make a penny off of the book. I do uh, right now trying to promote it more. Of course, it uh, for a long time, uh, it was mentioned... Uh, not for a long time, but it in the United States, Amazon.com featured it, but uh, it was always unavailable. It was available on their site in the UK for a while, and then it wasn't available, and et cetera, et cetera. You couldn't find mention of it uh, on a lot of search engines, even though uh, people had tried to put mention of it on there. Now, I don't know. I haven't looked recently, but since Trump's been in, I think that that ban, uh, if examined, uh, would kind of vaporize. But uh, nonetheless, uh, bear in mind this. If what I say in that book was not true, I would have been slapped with libel suits left and right. And I'm not. In fact, nobody will bring things up that I say because they're afraid of what else I'll say in defense of what I say. So I get uh, a lot of things I say, uh, I say out of the hope that they'll be discussed further by challenges. But the only thing that I've ever had, I've had a few of these uh, little hit artists that haunt Facebook and other outlets for alternative media and so forth. And I've been on forums. I stay off of them now because anything that I say or do is going to be hit with a bunch of nasties that try nothing more to do. They don't have any challenges. They don't have any information to, to weigh up before me. And uh, they just are nasty. So uh, I don't like to be diverted from what I have to say. So I avoid them. But I haven't had any of the debunkers on my Facebook wall in a long time. And I certainly have had maybe only one or two call-ins that were in any way uh, debunking me. And they were very short and, of course, very crude. And the host uh, would usually get rid of them. But uh, as far as challenges, no. And I don't have because <laughs> they're afraid of what I'm going to say in defense of their challenge, mm -hmm. it'll open up a can of worms, and a lot of times it would. So I can go deeper into things, but I like to be invited. What is the title of your book? Siege in the Davis Mountains. 
and that is an actual. You can go online and read about that. It has to do with a group of the Republic of Texas that renegated, started uh, committing crimes that they weren't uh, held to account for, which led to the theft of $2.8 billion from the state treasury of Texas. Something very few people are aware of, but took place and... uh, you know, uh, agencies like the FBI know know about it. In fact, uh, they had nothing to do with it, but they know about it. And uh, the, when you have a system that keeps secrets and believes that the Humpty Dumpty will crash and never be able to be put back together again, they're so afraid of the truth. You know, and how their superiors look on them, and you know to to put it brief, the FBI is infiltrated, but they have a lot of good people. I met a lot of good people in that instance. They came to see me. They were all members of different agencies of the government twice. They know of my helping them bring an end, a peaceful end to the siege. And uh, that was meant to create a national conflict that would have allowed the government to declare martial law and a certain administration to keep their fat asses in the White House indefinitely. So that was one of three uh, occasions where I intervened for the sake of martial law not being declared. And if you go to my blog or our blog, because I have colleagues that have built it up and have done excellent work in helping me all the way through. So it's our blog. And then I could name them for you. They, you, you probably heard me talk about them before. There's Shuni, there's Tors, there's Crystal Clark, there's Myra. All of them have made important contributions. They're colleagues, uh, but uh, they paid a price. And uh, not just their time, but they've all paid a price. I have one of them that came from Germany to help me in my hour of need. And twice he's come flown over to help me uh, recover, and he's here now. He's been a big help. Uh, he's far more familiar with Max than I am. I have a Mac now. And uh, he's been a great help. I don't know what I would have done without him. So uh, I like to speak, uh, I like to give credit where credit's due, and uh, I wish other people would use that sort of thing as a model for their behavior towards their fellow human beings. And I believe your website is at emvsinfo.blogspot.com? It is, it is, and you will find a story about the other two times that uh, I did what I could to prevent uh, declaration of martial law. And um, where can they get the book again? Uh, you're not sure? It- uh, well, uh, just go online. Uh, I can uh, Google it. Uh, uh, Google it. See what you find. I know that it was on Amazon.com UK. What I'll do is on the blog. Uh, and uh, I know that on Crystal Clark's website, there are some links to where they can find the book. She's been spectacular in doing research that way where I haven't. Her website uh, you can find under her name, and uh, she will uh, have uh, links there. And uh, I can't give you much more information than that because I am just now getting back into the loop. Okay. Being home for just barely a month and uh, having been almost uh, uh, the prisoner of Zenda. <laughs> in hospitals and nursing homes for the last two and a half years. Well, James, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, sir. Uh, Have a great evening, and I hope we talk again soon. Very well. Very well. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye.